Добра вечер, почитувани гледачи, аз сум Анастасија Илиевска, а вие гледате за или против. Овој пат емисијата на место во студио ја преселивме во Охрид и тоа имаме многу добра причина, бидејќи Охрид не делава е местото каде што буквално во еден во едно место се собрани околу 40 на млади луѓе од целиот свет, меѓутоа и предавачи кои што на тие млади луѓе им пренесуваат знаења од лидерски вештини до останати менеджерски способности и вештини кои што сигурно ќе им помогнат во нивното секојдневие и оформување на својата личност, меѓутоа и професионално усовршување. Тука сме бидејќи токму денеска ќе имам чест да направам интервју со еден човек, еден иноватор, кој што во суштина на еден начин во вистинска смисла го менува светот на земјата. Станува збор за Дейвид Голдсмит, кој што е кооснувач и председател на Голдсмит организацијата, меѓутоа еден и од водечките светски бизнис предвидувачи, експерти за менеджирање и лидерство, меѓутоа е извршен директор на проектот Мунхат. Зашто станува збор, ке дознаете токму денеска, ви представувам еден многу интересен разговор во продолжение. Ке продолжам на англиски, па узијуете. Мистер Голдсмит, welcome. Thank you. I had uh, presented you in front of our viewers, but uh, what I didn't say is that this is your, not your first time here in Macedonia. So what brings you back here? What brings me back was, I guess, the original orientation. I had met uh, Arena Chovsevska, sorry, and I met her in the States while I was meeting some individuals at NASA and we got along incredibly well and she invited me to come to present for this group so I was introduced and I've come back I think it's this is my fourth or my fifth time this time I'm here for 10 days and I think I'm presenting five times so the reason I come back I, there's opportunities and amazing people all over the world and I have found that when I've come here I've met some really amazing people and if you can collect amazing people to be your friends mm -hmm. and part of your life there's not much richer than you can have than doing that. This year you were invited by School for Young Leaders of President Ivanov. Yeah. This is also not your first time to lecture for this school, right? Yes. So, uh, what uh, can you tell us, what do you think about the youth here in Macedonia? Because you have met youth from Macedonia, but also from the other side, uh, places on, on uh, Earth. The world. So please, we want to know what do you think about the youth in Macedonia? That's a very loaded question, a very challenging question, because you're asking me to bulk everybody together. Mm -hmm. I lived in Hong Kong for uh, over a decade. I've lived in Luxembourg, and I would say that each area, each group, has its own challenges and its own opportunities. So yesterday, and I think you were there for the presentations that were delivered, not everybody's from Macedonia. Mm -hmm. They're from Iran background and from the, from the States and they're from Germany. And Literally from every part, yeah, of, part the, of the world. Of the world. So, yes. uh, well, I don't know if you have Asia. Uh, we have in the previ previous, the previous years. But yeah. today. And so I think that the youth are having the same challenges that everybody else has. Mm -hmm. And they're, it's not an easy answer. There's a, a data point. I don't know how true it is, but I've used it because it sounds pretty accurate. 30% of the individuals in the world, the world today under the age of 30 mm -hmm. have no hope for the future. Now that's a scary number. Imagine you have a business with a thousand employees and 300 of them don't think that there's a future for the organization. Or a company with 10 people and three don't believe there's a future. Why do you think is these statistics? Uh, I, can, I can give that answer, mm -hmm. so I'll try to do it as quickly as possible. I think today the only aspiration that they can have or the aspirations that they have tend to be, I want to be an influencer and I want to make money. If you traveled back in time about 50 years ago or 100 years ago, we would conquer, we would build. There were opportunities to create new things. So when people thought about a new tomorrow, it was building new technology, going to a new land. And if you think about the world today, everything's been done. If you want to go to Mount Everest, you will see garbage all over the place, and you might even have to stand on line to get to the top. If you go to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, 50 years ago, you couldn't even take a camera picture the same way, but there weren't 3,000 people in your background. So where do you go to, ex 
to build something new. And that's part of the challenge with the world today is finding that new hope and aspiration. Mm -hmm. That's part of the project. We'll talk about a little yes. bit later. Uh, but it's that whole, they're, they're missing. And I'll give you three very quick examples. I'm, I'm on a call with a 32-year-old. And I said, what do you think the next? And she said, what's your timeline? Just out of the blue. And I said, whatever you want. She thinks, she thinks. I believe all humanity will be dead in 50 years. That's a pretty shocking thing. I had a woman I was sitting next to at a restaurant. She knew a little bit about the project that we're working on and the work that we're doing around the world. And she said, I want to tell you that I have two daughters, one that's 10 and one that's 12, and every morning I wake up and tell them never have children. The world's a terrible place. Imagine every day your parent telling you never to have children. And then I had a 40, um, this woman who was very active in social causes. She's out of Singapore. Amazing individual. She's on stage talking about investing in the possibilities. And I tell her what we're working on, which is not a short story. And there's a lot. And when we're done, she says, thank you. But in a way that I was a little uncomfortable, like, why are you acting this way? And I said, are you OK? And she said, I have four children. Nothing is working. And I'm terrified for their future. This is uh, ex exactly what a lot of people here in Macedonia are feeling. The same things that you were saying. We had a lot of political crisis, economical crisis. Uh, the, uh, we had a lot of challenges as a nation. So I think that a lot of people who are listening to you can surely agree with the people that you asked yes. are feeling the same way. So how can we change this mindset? The minds, the way it's being approached, it, it, Currently, I don't uh, uh, think first of all, is this uh, is is the world so bad? I mean, you've been all around the world. Why do we all have that feeling that things aren't as good as, as it could be? So I, I would I would argue that I hear all the time, and everybody has their own opinion, and that's okay. People will say it's not as bad. Look at what we have, mm -hmm. and yes, we have a tremendous amount. Yet we have different challenges than generations before us. And by the way. Every generation thinks the generation younger than them is lost, and every generation thinks the people above them didn't really have a good line of hope. And we can go back generations, so this is nothing new. Yet there are challenges that are impacting us in a way that's different than in the past. In the past, it was purely people-people uh, people challenges, you know, territories and fighting over territories. But today we have a little bit different nemesis, a little bit of uh, uh, challenge. We have the earth that is changing. Now, we, we can't blame, I'm not someone to blame climate change or not. Some people don't believe in it, that's theirs, some people do. Yet it is, there are changes and you cannot fight mother nature. See, I can fight a battle politically. I can go after another country. I could try to work with my team. But mother nature doesn't care. Mm -hmm. And so in, uh, I'm a globalist. I've worked all over the world, over 50 countries. I will use an American example because it's current. We have Helen, the hurricane that just went through. It, devastating beyond imagination. But I've seen some data that if you went back, and I don't have it in front of me, so I'm trying to remember it. If you went back about 30, 40 years ago, there was a billion dollar adjusted for inflation disaster every eight, uh, 18 months. Today, they're, they're happening more and more all over the world. Mm -hmm. So is it actually happening? It's a perspective. I would say we have more opportunity, but m many of the people that say that have not worked in, in countries where uh, Botswana, Zambia, South Africa, they haven't worked. I, I, I'm going to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Cambodia, Malaysia, Singapore, Bangladesh, China, the United States, Canada, uh, Colombia. If you go around the world, you do see a challenge of how to be able to adapt and create a new future. And the challenge is the approach that's being used is one that doesn't sync with human nature. And that's where, really, if you want to know, that becomes the next question. So uh, I will go now to your project, Moon Hut. Yeah. So in your website, we can read this. We are improving life on Earth for all species by es establishing a box with a roof and a door on the moon. Yep. Please explain us what is Project Moon. So Project Moon Hunt is not a simple story. So I'm going to say that if you're interested in taking a step, 
a very small step. You can go to projectmoonhut.org, moonhut, H-U-T, dot org. We were named by NASA. I won't go over that right this moment. And so we kept the name. It's not exactly the right name, but it works. So we're, we're building a, com humans need to build. We are not reductionistic. So the solutions that are being offered, whether it be from uh, COP or the 17 SDGs, or it's the Royal Family's uh, Earth Prize, they tend to not have an interconnected set of conditions that are, are solutions. So think about it this way. We got to where we are today based upon an interconnected set of conditions that happened over decades and centuries. How do we solve them or address them or adapt to them with a single source solution? You have to simultaneously create a multitude of new changes. So when it evolves, it addresses those challenges. Mm -hmm. Our project is bringing together not reductionistic approaches, but how do we build ourselves out to a new tomorrow? And so the project does a few things. We're accelerating, uh, we're, this is the full directive. We're not a mission, we're not a vision, we're not a goal, we're a directive. Establishing a box with a roof and a door on the moon, that's a home. A box with a roof and a door is a home. Project Moon Hut was named by NASA. Project Moon Hut, a hut is a home. Mm -hmm. We took the name because NASA gave it to us. Through the accelerated development of an Earth and space-based ecosystem. So we're working on platforms to bring people together in a way they've never been more done before. We're working on tech transfer to move information and technology faster from one place to another. Today, people hold them in vaults. Companies have them in technology that could be useful, but it's not economically viable. We want to accelerate it from, uh, from Botswana to Japan to uh, Argentina. Move innovations that are, can be used across different areas as fast as possible. We can't go out and tell the world to change, and that's what a lot of people are saying, because human nature is not to change in that way. So what if we used immersive technologies, AR, VR, digital twin, haptics, 3D, 4D, gaming, toys? I mean, the first interracial kiss happened on Star Trek. I'm not talking space, we're not a space project, mm -hmm. but it happened on Star Trek. If you were using your mobile phone, well, remember the flip recorder that was on Star yes. Trek? How many movies, I, I love The Notebook, and it's a love story. Mm -hmm. How many movies have, or books or immersive or concerts or speeches have moved you? So we don't want to go out and tell the world, tell them to change, it's not going to happen. But we want to show them new opportunities. So I'm giving you a few of them. We're covering mining and new materials. We're working on all sorts of categories because the intersection of builders is to create a new future. A builder, so let's say building a home, they pick a piece of land, they don't say, everybody, let's make a home. No, they build it. They figure out the plans, the designs, and all of them have to come together. Mm -hmm. So our project is over a 40-year timeline, 40 years. What, how could we make this happen? So here's a way to think about it. Take your age and add 40 years. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself, what do you think the world will really be like over 40 years? Not the stories. You could be pessimistic, the end, like I told you. Or you could think of flying cars and, and um, you know, robots in your home, take care of your food and food and your groceries. But that was promised in 1962 with the Jetsons. Mm -hmm. I woke up in a bed, I used a toilet in the morning, I still use a microwave to heat my milk, that's 1945 technology. I've never seen a flying car. So, we can have these, that's great. But how do we get there? And our project is to put in place the pieces that create a new home and a new future. Adapting for the generational changes. Your child, and I think you have one, two children? Two. You have two children. Add 40 years to their age and ask what they will be like. Mm -hmm. And if you hadn't realized that they will be older than you are today. They will be older than you, so they could have children. So you could have three generations on this planet in 30 year, 40 years. Our project is so that you and your children become 25 and 30, they say, I want a different world. And we're, we're using human behavioral and sociological changes as part of our project to create a new future. So where are you now in this project? Uh, you have started, yeah. you have 40 years resolution, yeah. right? So where are you right now? Uh, 
we our project 40 years will be the the time in which we said 40 will be 2063 mm -hmm. so that's the the final we started about 10 years ago and we we got some momentum in the beginning the challenge was i didn't know enough i realized very quickly i wasn't smart enough about the categories so it took about three four years mm -hmm. to learn try to figure, put the pieces together. I'm a strategist. I also have worked with the CEOs of Maersk, Dole, Tektronix, Infosys, Wipro. So mine was to figure out a plan that makes this work. And so where we are today is we have teams all over the world. We've had organizations help us. KPMG, Deloitte, PwC, EY, Kirkland Ellis, the seventh largest law firm in the world, has an unlimited engagement letter. Maples Group, Carta, JP Morgan Private Banking all quietly in the background. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've built the foundation. We are a foundation, we're a nonprofit, 501c3, but we're also for-profit. The, for, the big four said they've never seen anything like us. Mm -hmm. What we're now doing is becoming a little bit more visible. We've been just doing the work. We don't need a lot of people trying to figure us out in social media. And you, got, you need the right people, right? We need the right people, so I'm hunting. Okay. That's one reason I'm here, I'm yes. hunting I, I, That will be the next question. You have a um, chance to meet wonderful people here of the School for Young Leaders of President Ivanov, and I think you've you've hunted some, uh, I, some of them. I, I'm so not some a farmer, you, I'm a hunter, yes. Yes, so some of you probably will work for uh, Project Moonhut, right? They will work with us, with yes. Us, yes. So we already have some people on the team because we, the project here from Macedonia, I've been asked to speak and present mm -hmm. multiple times different topics. One of them is about my book, Paid to Think, and, and leadership, but another one is our project. And so I, one of the sayings I have is the smartest person in the room is the person who asks the best questions of themselves and of others. And in the room, I heard some absolutely incredible questions. And during our past four weeks, we've been working together. So there are individuals who've already said, uh, I want to be a part of this project. And so just some absolute, there's a saying you give people the benefit of the doubt and then you work with them and they let you down. Mm -hmm. I always just start with, I don't know you, you show me what you're capable of. And you, in this room, there are some absolutely brilliant people. And so they've already said they want to work with us, which is fantastic. Yes, congratulations about that. And congratulations about uh, giving the young people opportunity because we really need that, not just here in Macedonia, but everywhere. everywhere. But when it comes to Macedonia, for example, and I want to make, um, um, uh, parallel to the course of the project Moon Hut and the problems we as Macedonian society are facing, but also it's a global problem. And you are talking about sustainable ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So the capital of Macedonia, Skopje, is having a lot of problems with the waste disposal. But it's not just a problem of Skopje from the other, other towns in Macedonia also having that problem. So to us, the simple things, the simple things are problem. And you're saying to think a lot of bigger than, than that. But uh, how can we think bigger when we are facing so uh, such a problems like waste disposal, you know, something that is very basic? Okay. So we have to change something very basic before we start to think very big, right? Okay. So what will be your suggestion to maybe... Make the it more local. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. Okay. So first of all, I don't use the word problem. I use the word challenge. Challenge, okay. A problem people lean on. Do you mm -hmm. want a problem? I'll tell you my problem. They lean back. If I say I'll give you an opportunity, I hear that all the time. So I use the word challenge. So I'll substitute that in there. You have a challenge with waste disposal, but the solutions that we're putting out there today are often not taking into account the interconnectedness of our world. So for example, you could try to solve or address something, but the next community or the next one or the next one is not doing it. So it doesn't work that way. Macedonia is working on their solutions, waste disposal, but I'm gonna give you a different perspective. Reductionism won't work. We have to take care of the plastics and the materials and the, and the waste, but it just won't work. So the challenge is, this is their challenge, how do you create a future taking into account human behavior, taking into account desire to build and grow, to move things forward? If we could have done it 50 years ago, maybe, but today we have to build more. So everything we're working on, we don't solve climate change in the way you would think, because you can't solve climate change. 
You can't solve mass extinction. We call them the six mega challenges. There are six, not 17 SDGs. All of those, they don't, there's only six. Human behavior likes three. Three little bears, three little pigs, three is a good number. Mm -hmm. We have six. And our solutions are to accelerate innovation worldwide at an unbelievable pace. Our solutions are to change the way we collaborate worldwide. Our solutions are to build and grow. It's the paradigm shift people to think. You hopefully in these few minutes and even with me in there are saying, huh, I didn't think about it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, when you learn something, you then innovate differently. When you look, then you collaborate differently. Then you paradigm shift again and you, your perspective keeps on changing. So what we're looking to do is accelerate innovation worldwide. We can't do it the way we're doing it. We have to get more people to think differently and reductionism is just a dead end. So uh, the next question, uh, you've mentioned before and a few times um, that cooperation and collaboration and learning between each other is crucial about the future we are planning to have, right? Yep. So what will be your suggestion to the leaders maybe here in Macedonia, everywhere, what they can learn from Project Moonhat about cooperation, collaboration, and exchanging ideas? Okay, it's a very loaded question. There's a lot in there. You do know I wrote a very thick book on... Uh, there will be questions about okay. you also. It's a very thick book, and there, but there's a lot of tools in there. The way we're leading is in silos. And so when people get out of university or they work, they learn in silos. <clears throat> but if you've ever run a business, and most people haven't, there's an interconnected set of every decision you make. If we decide we're going to build an addition, it involves law, it involves how many toilets you have, it involves how the employees are going to work. There's always an interconnected set. So for, for someone who's interested to find out more, I would suggest instead of trying to bite the whole elephant at once, there's an expression, how do you eat an elephant one, uh, one bite at a time, is to learn a little bit about Project Moon Hut and say, okay, I don't get it. I don't understand how this works. It's not because you're not smart. It's because they haven't been teaching individuals to really think in interconnectedness. So this, the first thing they would do is find out a little bit more about us and say, well, where are they coming from? And ours is, we need to bring the world together in a collaborative way, but I can't ask someone to collaborate. What I can do is put mechanisms in place for them to collaborate. So we're working on a platform that would bring together all and all these people are volunteering. We have one of the top computational social scientists in the world working with us. If you've ever gotten a text message from Amazon that says your package has arrived, the guy who came up with that and built that for all of Amazon's on our team, mm -hmm. Paul Allen. Uh, had a pr uh, project manager, one of his top, he's on our team. And we have tons of individuals. And we have this platform we're looking to build that will give opportunities for people to see the world in a different way. Very quickly, you go to Google. Why do you, Google only wants you to sell something. You go to chat, they want your data. Our application is being designed to help you achieve your desired outcomes in a way that's not been done before, adding computational social science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, predictive analytics, network analysis. So we're creating a mechanism for change. Because to ask people to collaborate, that's, that's, doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You need to have the environment, such as the leadership school, put people at a table, have an event, have them collaborate. But they're still not gonna collaborate if they don't know how or they don't have the tools to do it. And skills. Excuse me? And skills. Yeah, and skills, and that's part of it. So we'll continue more about uh, the strategies that you have in your book, Paid to Think, sure. and a lot more, but we have to make a short break here. I invite the uh, viewers to stay with us and to be with us on the second part of this interview. Добре дойдохте назад по читувани гледачи. Се надавам дека го задрживме вашето внимание. Продолжуваме со вториот дел од ова интервју со господин Девид Голдсмит. So, Mr. Goldsmith, I have been there for your lecture and some interesting thing you've said. And you've said that you can create change in a very short period of time. Yes. We are thinking that change 
big change. Yeah. We need the time, you know, to events to be one by another. So the the atmosphere is maybe right for a change. But you think differently. Why is that? It's it's not a why. It's just the fact that you can create change instantaneously. Mm -hmm. It's the plans that you put in place to make that happen. So if you change the systems and structure around people, it's faster than trying to change them behaviorally. Now there's a TED talk, TEDx, and Luxembourg that I recommend, I don't know if you saw it, but you've been given the, the three TEDx's I've done, Dubai, Hong Kong, and Luxembourg. In that I talk about the 80-20, uh, it's a, I hate saying this, but I have to, Someone named it. I called it a productivity principle, and someone at a conference walked up and said, they were all talking about the Goldsmith productivity principle, and I said, I have no clue what you guys are talking mm -hmm. about. And they named it the Goldsmith productivity principle. So it's a principle that 80% of the results in an organization or in life comes from the systems and structure in place and not the people. If you try to change the people, it's very difficult. If you change the systems and structure around them, you end up being able to make the change faster. But it's also another value. It allows individuals who are in part of that system that are having challenges to be able to focus it to make the change. So let's say you're a reporter that every time you went out on a job, things went wrong. And I figured out, and you, were, you go to meetings and you say, you have to do this, you have to do this. And I sit there and say, I want to change her personality. I want her to be nicer to people. No, that's not the issue. What if I then said, you know, we made a profit this year. I'm going to get better cameras, better microphones. I'm going to fix the scheduling system. And I'm going to, going to make sure that there is a better internal mechanism for scheduling interviews. And you walk in one day and you say, oh my god, look at all that. This is so good. Now everything can be done. So I can change that very quickly because you'll show up and now you'll be a nice person because you were trying to get something done. Or if I asked you, how would you solve it? You'd say, well, this person needs to change and this one doesn't. But then when you saw all the cameras and all the new equipment and all the tools, you say, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. So you can make change quickly. I gave you one that's very personal, give you one that's a little bit more organizational. We're looking to change how we perceive how do we work in a new future? And it's a combination, I didn't really realize it, it was actually one of the students here. I asked a question of her, what did she think of Project Moon Hut? So this, the students have been working for four weeks already on projects for Project Moon Hut. It's a nonprofit, they're donating their time to help. And I said, what did you think? And she started talking about paid to think. And then she went to the project. And I had to stop. You can ask them. And I said, wait, I'm, I'm a little confused. We were asked about this. And you gave an unbelievable answer. She said, you talk about enterprise thinking. You talk about interconnectedness of education. You, you give tools to us. Hey, Project Moon is doing the same thing. And I, sometimes you don't want to feel like you've done something so good that it's, she pointed out, I didn't. It was Mena. Mena brought it out. And I said, mm -hmm. wow, I hadn't thought of bringing them together in that way because this is not about me. Mm -hmm. And when you start talking about a book that's been produced with my name on it, it then becomes about me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to. It wasn't the intention. It was to help the students grow. So that's how you can create the change. You can create all of that fast. But actually your book, uh, Pay to Think, is um, focused uh, a lot about strategic thinking. And I think personally that strategic thinking is something that we can learn in schools, but they don't teach us there. Oh, no, no, no. You, don't, you don't learn anything. Strategy, interconnected, no, no, no. But it's really important. We can all agree because it's the, the basics about the future, maybe, how to, to plan, how to react, etc. So please tell us uh, what can we learn, briefly, shortly, like a resume from your, your book. Uh, what can we learn about uh, and how can we use the strate strategic thinking in the times of crisis? Because, you know, one of the topics, main topics about the School of Young Leaders is leadership for peace. We are also living in a very complex times yeah. when everything is changing. We have wars, we have cyber, uh, cyber security is a big question. Um, so the ecosystem, the global warming, we have a lot of things going on right now, pandemics, etc. So how does strategic thinking 
can help us in the time of crisis. Okay. Very quickly, don't think business. We strategize all the time. You strategize how you're going to raise your children. You strategize how you're going to drive someplace. You strategize when you're going grocery shopping for a meal, for a holiday. You, you're planning all the time. But how many times have you been taught how to interconnect all those things? You're not. You don't have, I bet you, if you look at your whole career, nobody said, let's tie all these things together so that you can go grocery shopping. Well, you're learning priority management. So the book is not about strategic thinking. It's about the role of an, a leader is that they are paid to think. What that means is people who do the work, camera operator, camera operators here to do and think about how to set this up and make it work. You have to strategize about that. You have to think about it. You have to plan for it. You have a different set of conditions. But the person who's leading, they, they don't have any output. Like there's no product made. Their job is to figure out where the future is and how to get there. So in the book we're covering, and I'm not a good person promoting the book because that's not what I like to do. We talk about planning. We talk about new product and service development. We talk about creating alliances. We talk about forecasting, how to forecast. We actually do have a chapter in there leading the charge. That's the time where the leader goes out and does something. So I wouldn't say it's a strategic book. It's a way to look at. It's a life book disguised as a business book. The things we need to do to create change, and it works everywhere. It will work in every, n n there are over 400 examples. I was there for 72%, I do not say it. Nothing made in the book that didn't work in the real world first, and it's global. You're gonna see examples from China, you're gonna see examples from Hong Kong, being living there, you're gonna see from South Africa, Botswana, you're gonna see it from everywhere, all over the world. So, but the main question is, uh, how important is strategic, strategic thinking? How important is thinking? Uh -huh. So you're saying strategic. I'm saying thinking. That's important. That's the job of a person who wants to create change. They have to think something through well enough so when they hand it to you, it becomes successful. So our job is to think, not just strategic thinking. It's thinking. Let's take that word out. You're going to put on a dinner and there's two people in front of you. One person who's cooked a lot, and then there's me who hasn't cooked as much. This person, you say, I want you to saute the vegetables. And you know they cook. You say, saute vegetables, got it. You're gonna now lead me. I say, what do you mean? So for me, I need to know a set of tools. Your job is to figure out the tools I need. Oh, so you're gonna to need to know what oil, what type of pot how hot you gonna, what flame you turn it on. How do you put them in? How long do I mix them? What is considered when it's good? What is considered when it's bad? So all of that is part of thinking. It's the role of the person in leadership to figure all that out. Does that make sense? Yes. So uh, one of the things that you lecture there when I, was, uh, when I was hearing your lecture, and it really got me thinking about how important is what we do every day, how we plan, how we think. Uh, you've mentioned that before you had the lecture, you, you, you were thinking what are you going to wear, what shoes are you going to wear, even what kind of socks are you going to, yes. to wear. And I don't think that a lot of us are very uh, conscious about how important are the small things in life, not just the big things, but maybe the small things in life. Because we do every day, I mean, we are busy, we have families, we have work, we have jobs, we want to uh, do different stuff in, in one day. But how, how, how many times we forget about those little things and how important are they for every individual, but how important are for the ones who are leading and thinking. thinking. Okay, so let me give you a quick analogy and I think you'll get uh, a relationship. When horses are grown to be racers, race horses, they have to feed them, they have to train them, they have to grow them, they have to keep them in homes, they have to train the jockeys, they put all the time in. They bring them to the racetrack, let's use the one I know, Kentucky Derby. They put them into the slot and the gun goes off. They go to the first turn and they're going neck and neck and they, they, then the back turn and they're, one's going ahead, one's going by. They move around to the last turn and you, the races, the horses are going and you hear the phrase and the horse wins by a nose. What happens to the other horse? What happens to the other horse? If one wins by a nose, mm -hmm. the other one loses by a nose. Now when it comes to a contract, 
a sale, sustainability, future, children. If you lose by a nose in horse racing, one purse might be a million euros. But the second place is 250,000 euros. Third place is 50,000. They did all the same work. A one one by a nose. And we see it in the Olympics. We see it in sports. Very easy analogy. You can lose by one point in a football game in the last 16 seconds. They won by a nose. The other one goes home with nothing. Same thing in business. You don't know what opportunities are in front of you that you have to be aware of to make them work. So I sit, I sat upstairs, I brought a ton of clothing, I was trying to figure out what I needed, and then I said, well, the audience changed a little bit, or how am I going to interact? I didn't know the environment I was going to be in. So I said, I wanted, I wanted a jacket and all my clothing. This is not a boast, it's not an ego thing. I lived in Hong Kong, so I became very good friends with a tailor. And we got along, so I got all my co uh, clothing is custom made. It's not as expensive when you live there, but it's still expensive. So I picked this jacket because it has a blue, it has a lightness to it, goes with the way I look. I didn't wear the pants that I brought with it. I changed the jeans. I said I want that. I decided to wear this shirt. My shirt doesn't have buttons on it. I designed it that way. But I also wear a cufflink, and the cufflink is a violin. So if it came up, Violin is the most, one of the most difficult uh, instruments to learn. So it was a reminder to me that even though I might know how to do something, I've got to remember other people also have challenges. We, I was very, it's very difficult. So all of these pieces are so, not just in that, in everything. Those little details, they're not complicated. But if you just spent a few seconds saying, how do I connect to the audience? Not impress the audience, because that was never, you've heard me speak already. It's not my, the way I walk out there. It's that I want to make sure there's no barriers. I want someone to look up and say, well, that's all taken care of. So now they can engage with the content. So while you might not see it as an audience member, how I walk, how I move, all tied together. It's the detail, it's little things. It's not that little things always matter, because there are sayings like that. It's just if you want to, if you're paid to think, your job is to figure out all the things so that you can do your job as a reporter. He could do it as a cameraman. The person over there who's taking care of the coffee has all the tools that they've got. If you take those things away, they can do their job and they can excel. So using, uh, having in mind what you've just said, I want to go through what maybe politicians do, you know, they usually do short term plans due to elections usually due to election cycles, but how important is for the politicians, the ones who are leading our, our state, thinking globally maybe, how important is to have a long-term strategies? Because we as Macedonians, uh, we had a lot of challenges facing. Maybe some decisions were, were so wrong because we didn't see, we didn't think long-term, okay? We've got the name change. We have two bilateral. I was here. Yep. We have a two, uh, two bilateral agreements. One with Bulgaria, one with Greece. Now the agreement between Macedonia and Bulgaria is giving us a hard time in our European future. So sometimes the thinking short term and maybe long term is giving us a hard uh, hard times as uh, as people because politicians should think more strategically it 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 is easy to put a signature on a on a paper but what afterwards okay so here let me jump back what you're you're at, it's a great question I, politics scares me because people they they're very good at planning underhanded things you don't know what they're doing when they do they do. they learn politics it's a messy dirty game Here's one thing. There's a difference between an idea and a plan. Most politicians have ideas, they don't have plans. Even though they're that big, they're not a plan. A plan is something that you can hand off to somebody that they could follow and they will get it right. For example, going back to the cooking, you could hand one person a plan and the food will come out. But if you didn't give me all the pieces I need, the food won't come out, like the grocery list. I don't know what to buy, or I don't know what's better. So. The plans are not there. So I often will say to people when they say, well, you've just heard the plan, I told it to you. I said, you didn't give me a plan, give me an idea. Where's the plan? Who's gonna execute it? How's it gonna work? Where's the budget coming from? And I, it's easy to come up with ideas and most politicians, at least I'm gonna, that's a bad way to say it. I would say in my experience, most leaders have more ideas than they have plans. And that's good and bad. You need ideas. 
but you need to be able to filter them down to something. So getting back to Macedonia, I think you've had, uh, you're in a challenge, you were trying to get in the EU, you had the North Macedonia, I know the fight because I was here when that was going on, that, you know, the, the culture, what do you want to be, and there were challenges with the decision being made. I mean, that was uh, the repercussions through Macedonia. I don't think there's a lot of plans on uh, how to actually make something work. Now, here's the key. If a plan is really good, it also includes a plan to sell it, which has to be really good. And if people feel that that plan will get them where they want to go, leadership is getting people to where they want to go. So I have a company. Let's just say I have a company. I have someone working in the company. Am I getting them to where I want to go? No. My job is to figure out where they want to go, and hopefully we're in the same direction. So my job is to figure out where they want to go and help them get to where they want to go. And if I do, they'll be excited about it. They'll be engaged. If they look at the plan and go, oh, this is terrible, then they won't. So leadership is about creating plans that work. And if they're there, they should stay. So uh, having in mind everything that you have said, all the ideas that we have discussed, what is your look about the future? Being here in Macedonia, maybe, do we inspire you some, somehow? Uh, are we moving forward as the direction, as the young people, etc.? But what are your general thoughts about the future? Because you've been everywhere in the world. I, okay. Small countries, big countries. Why are your, I, I, how do you think the world we will? Have, uh, our project is not about the six mega challenges, it's about building tomorrow. I believe we'll have about 23 years of really, really, really tough times. Mm -hmm. We've had 18,000 war recorded conflicts since the beginning of time. We're not going to stop having conflicts. We don't have, we have them in our homes, we have them in our businesses, we have them in our communities, we're not going to stop. Yet we need to be able to bring that down a little bit for our younger generations and even for us. You're going to be around in 40 years, so it's for us too. So I do think that we're going to get worse before we get better. I think a new generation of decision making has to come about because they've had challenges. I don't want to live this way anymore. The social media, and I'm not picking on the category, but the, I think that's going to evolve. I believe that we're going to start asking different questions of ourselves, and that's part of change. Sometimes you have to be challenged to create change. And so I think the next 23 years we'll have that, and then after that we'll be on the upswing. Now, 3.2 billion people will die of old age. So there's also going to be a changing of the guard. I'm including that in my forecasting. That's included in our plan. We know that will happen. And then we're going to start to see a change, and we call it the age of infinite. It's not the fifth industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, which is IoT and faster devices. No, that's just more of the same. We're going to have the age of infinite, infinite possibilities and infinite resources. So we're going to, the we've, brought the moon and earth together, I think we, live we, are, we do live between them. The moon keeps us spinning at a speed that it does, keeps us at our axis of rotation. I'm not a space person. But it also creates, makes our tides move, it changes our weather, women's biological cycles are tied to it, animals' biological cycles are tied to the moon. Maybe we, our new future is an expansion of where we are. Again, we're not going to have a million people on different planets, that's not going to happen. We're only going to have 8, 90, 578, 1,644, which is nothing in terms. But the innovation solved for the, for the moon, solved for Earth. So what we're doing is we're creating this future that I believe within 40 years, you're going to wake up, you're going to have your bambinos, you're going to have your grandchildren, and you're going to say, this is, this is turning out okay. Thank you very much. This was a very good ending of this interview, giving it a really good impulse about the future. Почтувани, тоа беше вечерашното интервју. Се надевам дека уживавте и дека добивте еден интересен поглед од господин Голсми за тоа како би изгледала и днината и како ние со оно што го правиме во сегашноста може да влијаеме на днината. Ви посакувам да имате убав остаток од вечер два и секако останете на фреквенцијата на телевизија АФА.